so what I'm what I'm going to talk about today is uh, I hope uh, something that sheds some light on uh, the origins of the source of what we know as Thomas Dutton, namely uh, a work that uh, pretty much propels that phenomenon, uh, and or at least we can argue if it does. So on the eve of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's centennial. Uh, Today, uh, he would have been 100 years old tomorrow, uh, the second day of our conference. So today, as back in 1962, uh, metaphorically speaking, figuratively, there is little doubt that the life uh, of his firstborn and most celebrated character, Ivan Denisovich Shukhov, turned out to be certainly much longer uh, than one day. Uh, a day that was meant to embrace Shukhov's entire 10-year term in the Gulag. One day in the life of Antinisovich indeed stretched beyond the entire uh, epoch of which this typical day in the life of, of an ordinary uh, prisoner was supposed to become both an artistic image and an eyewitness testimony. Conceived in captivity in the early 50s when his author was still in the camps, the former peasant, Red Army soldier, uh, hurled behind the barbed wire for the sole crime of uh, being taken prisoner by the Germans, Ivan Denisovich Shukhov saw the light of the end of pictures of Novy Mir, uh, as we all know, in November 1962. <clears throat> uh, his birth was a literary mir miracle, as again Kornei Chukovsky titled his internal review of the manuscript earlier that year. Um, and it was assisted uh, first and foremost by Alexander Twardowski, uh, the editor-in-chief of the journal, the Apokolev and Reza Arlova, and by Nikita Khrushchev himself, who personally sanctioned, sanctioned the publication. It came uh, to be a turning point in the history of 20th century Russian literature, uh, both at home and abroad, a crossroads of sorts between official state publishing, uh, as that underground circulation of manuscripts, in Russia, uh, some is that, and the publication of these manuscripts abroad, or in time is that, where uh, many, if not most, of them uh, first see the light of day without their author's knowledge or consent long before uh, they get first published in Russia. Um, so it is this crossroads that, crossroads that many previously silenced authors had arrived at uh, by or in the wake of 1962 with their clandestine manuscripts on the Gulag and other traumatic topics of the Soviet recent past, uh, which the publication of Solzhenitsyn's Ivan Denisovich, I would like to argue, both emancipated and inadvertently uh, precluded from being published at home. Uh, to name but a few, it would be Ahmadova's Requiem, uh, Lydia Chukovskaya's Sofia Petrovna, Evgenia Ginsburg's Journey into the Whirlwind or Krutoy Marshot. Uh, to name but a few. So what I was going to, uh, am actually going to uh, speak about today is exactly why, just why uh, this happened, this paradoxical emancipation of uh, an enormous influx of manuscripts on the Gulag, uh, and uh, how they uh, thereby became precluded or forced out of the official literary scene in Russia and into and into time is that. Um, and here, uh, as the title of my uh, talk invokes, suggests, obviously it invokes um, Garodi's Don Realism Sankri Bash, or Realism Without Shores, an influential work that I believe was first, uh, was written in 63, the year after, uh, miraculously. Uh, Solzhenitsyn's publication, but more immediately um, I have in mind the volume edited by uh, Thomas Lakuzin and uh, Evgeny Dobrenko, Socialist Realism Without Shores, uh, which includes um, an article by Katerina Clark on Socialist Realism with Shores. So, uh, uh, so I would like to su suggest a more, for the purposes of our conference, a more geographical understanding of Shores. And uh, at the end of my talk, perhaps uh, illustrate how socialist realism was a predominant framework, reception framework, not only of uh, not only in the Soviet Union, but on the other shore. Um, 
Otoku. Um, in his interview to BBC on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of Ivan Vnisevich, <coughs> that is in 1982, Solzhenitsyn spoke about that historical moment in the physical rather than literary or political terms, quote, the publication of my novella in the Soviet Union in 62 defied the laws of physics, as if, for example, objects would start taking off from the ground by themselves, or cold stones would by themselves start heating up and glowing. It was impossible, absolutely impossible, end of quote. So, once again, uh, what I would like uh, to think about today together with you is, is about just why it was, in fact, possible, uh, and why only then, or rather about what made it possible for Ivan Denisovich to be officially published at home, but impossible for other works on the same subject and around the same time. In analyzing the reasons for the unprecedented success of Ivan Denisovich vis-a-vis the shared failure, of other manuscripts on the Gulag to see the light of day in Russia. I suggest that Solzhenitsyn's heroic breakthrough was shaped to a point by its conformity to the dictates of socialist realism and Soviet mythology on the whole. So the key, uh, which makes the key to the miracle of Van Denisovich lay not in its subject matter, as it was has been customary uh, to think, but in its allegorical and social orchestration as well as in what we would uh, now be tempted to call perfect timing. Uh, one of the side effects of this miraculous publication of Solzhenitsyn's novella was such that uh, the numerous manuscripts it emancipated, whether they were written before or after the publication of Van Denisovich, were forced out of the official literary scene, um, and after circulating in Samizdat, eventually dicta broke. Apart from its many exploits at home, uh, Ivan Denisovich thus generated a steady inflow of contraband manuscripts first into the underground field of Samizdat um, in Russia and then into Tamizdat. So much so that Tamizdat as a bridge, if it is a bridge between Russian literature and home and abroad, at, and at the same time a weapon on the literary fronts of the Cold War, so much so that it really, Tamizdat, took shape in earnest, not after, perhaps, Dr. Zhivago in 1957, uh, which was published in Italy in 1957, but after Ivan Denisovich came out, came, comes out five years later in Russia. Had this not happened, Solzhenitsyn confessed in 1975, quote, I would have sent a microfilm with my camp writings abroad under the pen name Stepan Khlynov. As such, and, and such microfilm had indeed been prepared, end of quote. But this scenario uh, could not have possibly produced uh, the effect that the miraculous publication of Van Denisovich had at home. Um, besides, had Van Denisovich appeared in Tamizdat first, it would have clearly precluded it from coming out in Russia. Um, which does not pay, work the other way around. Of course, it was published, republished in Tamis Dad uh, after. And the fact that it did not actually happen, uh, the fact that the manuscript did not leak abroad within the year uh, from the time it was submitted to Novimir and that, until it was published, um, Solzhenitsyn refers to, uh, to it both. Uh, as a miracle of no smaller significance than its publication in the USSR itself, end of quote. Soon enough, Solzhenitsyn's other manuscripts, including his major novels, uh, and of course the Gulag Archipelago, would turn up uh, and be published in Tamis Dat long before uh, they are first published in Russia, uh, at a time when the Iron Curtain uh, rusts through. Uh, but who, uh, who knows uh, how long it would have taken uh, Akhmatova, uh, the author of Requiem, and Chukovskaya, the author of Soviet Petrovna, and a sequel to it going under, Spusk Podvodu, um, how long, uh, we can only fantasize about how long it would take uh, them and other non-conformist authors of the 20th century uh, Russian literature uh, to reach their readers, if only through Tamizdat first had their clandestine manuscripts 
not being given a distinct voice of their own by the semi-literate peasant Ivan Denisovich Shukhar. Mm -hmm. So, uh, coming back to this moment in 1962, uh, the effect uh, that the publication had on Akhmatovich Kosk and many other writers could actually be measured by uh, two weeks. If uh, we remember that the 11th November issue of Novy Mir comes out on November the 17th, and um, on December the 1st, Khrushchev made his uh, famous appearance at the Manesh exhibition of avant garde artists in Moscow, where his pronouncements affected a pogrom which is said to have uh, drawn the thaw to an end. Uh, so, what happened during these two weeks? And in, in the immediate aftermath, uh, transformed and analyzed the Russian literary landscape beyond recognition. Uh, suffice it to say that even Akhmatova, who had never before written down her requiem and only read it out loud to a close circle of friends, uh, now decided not only to declassify her poem and for the first time committed to paper, uh, but also to send it to the same journal that published Solzhenitsyn. The Emancipation of Requiem took place in early December, uh, as we learned from a couple of diary entries, uh, for example, from Julian Oxman's. Um, uh, who wrote down on December 9th, quote, uh, The conversation began when Akhmatova offered to take a look at her famous Requiem, which for the first time has been unified into a complete cycle. It was only yesterday, that is December 8th, uh, typed for the first time, but the strangest thing was Ahmadova's desire to include the full text of Requiem in her new book of poetry. Uh, he has in mind Bek Vremeni, uh, which was scheduled to be published in 65. It took me much effort, he continues, to convince Ahmadova that this poem could not be published just yet. Its pathos goes beyond the problematics of fighting the cult of personality. Its protest rises to the heights that no one will ever allow her to conquer. I even convinced her not to show it to the editors, who might destroy the whole book, again, if they report on requiem to the higher authorities. She defended uh, herself and her poem for a long time, claiming that Solzhenitsyn's novella and Boris Lutsky's poems about Stalin strike Stalin's Russia much harder than her requiem. Uh, Oxman's intuition nevertheless proved right on uh, both fronts. Requiem was indeed rejected by Tvardovsky in Novy Mir, uh, if you think of it, only weeks after it was for the first time written down. It began circulating in some that in thousands of copies already by the spring, as Natalia Garbanevska uh, testifies. Uh, she was one of, uh, one of those who contributed to this amount of manuscripts, and it soon leaked abroad uh, and was published in November 1963 in Munich. Uh, and it was, again, Oxman uh, who orchestrated the uh, transfer of, of the manuscript of Requiem, and tomorrow uh, we're going to hear a uh, first-hand account about this. So, while Requiem was submitted to Novy Mir soon after Ivan Denisovich, Lydia Chukovska and Sofia Petrovna ended up on Tvardovsky's desk simultaneously uh, with Solzhenitsyn's manuscript. Uh, Sofia Petrovna is the only work that we know about the Great Terror uh, written, that is uh, actually written down, not retrospectively, but quote, 22 years ago in Leningrad in the winter of 39 1940. Uh, as Tchaikovsky points out in her introduction, with little hope, quote again, that the school exercise book containing the clean, clean copy of it would escape destruction and be preserved, let alone be published, of course. The manuscript of Sofia Petrovna survived the siege of Leningrad and, in fact, outlived the man who kept, who kept it safe, despite all the risks. It was Isidore Blikin. Uh, on the eve of his death of starvation, walked across the besieged city with Tchaikovsky's notebook and gave it to her, uh, to his sister. Uh, and it was after Tchaikovsky came back to Denker in '44 that she reunited with, uh, uh, with her text. Akhmatova referred to Sofia Petrovna, a contemporary of Requiem, as its sister, 
And despite the obvious differences in form, singled it out as the most important work on Stalinism next to her own Requiem and Solzhenitsyn's One Day, uh, which she read before uh, it was published in Together with Tchaikovsky, actually, in September 1962. Uh, the story of Tchaikovsky's attempts to publish Sofia Petrovna at home uh, is very much parallel and perhaps as symptomatic uh, as Akhmatova's attempts to have Requiem published. Kept, in, kept secret for over 20 years, the clandestine manuscript was submitted for publication, rejected by several publishers, and leaked abroad, where it came out into different redactions, and even under different titles, in Paris and in New York, uh, at the same year, 1965. The Amy Gray publisher of the Parisian book, length edition two, must have taken Sophie Petrovna for the younger sister of Requiem, as we um, in other words, uh, the book edition is titled The Bustielu uh, Dom by the lines of, uh, the famous lines from Ahmadova's Requiem. Я давно предчувствовала этот светлый день и опустила дом. Like Requiem, Sofia Petrovna had to wait uh, two more decades before it came out in Russia during the Pirate Requiem. Tchaikovsky's foreword to Sofia Petrovna, nevertheless, is dated November 1962, which takes us back uh, to that moment or momentum uh, of Solzhenitsyn's Ivan Denisovich. But the foreword was written for the book-length edition of Sofia Petrovna uh, that was initially accepted and to be, was to be published by Sovietsky Pisatel. Uh, like many other publishing houses and periodicals, Sovietsky Pisatel at the time responded to Khrushchev's call uh, at the 22nd Congress of the, of the uh, party to debunk uh, Stalin and to actually take, him, take his body physically out of, of the mausoleum the same night uh, on October 31st, 1961. Um, but it was... Um, but already... So, so among other... Uh, Publication venues, of course, Tchaikovsky also submitted it to Novi Mir. But on November 6, uh, sorry, that was that is that is when it was submitted. On January 5, 1962, already Tchaikovsky received a rejection from Tverkovsky, and by the end of the month was actually able to read Tverkovsky's internal review. It said uh, that so. Fordovsky was already much infatuated with uh, Ivan Denisovich at the time, which was had been submitted was submitted to him uh, uh, around the same, literally the same week. Uh, the review said that Sofia Petrovna quote does not fill the background of all people's life. Не чувствует фона общей народной жизни. That Tchaikovsky's work on a spicy topic is boring to read. Скучно читать это литературное сочинение на острую тему. That no character in her text involved compassion, никого не жалко, and that the author failed to portray her characters as live people, uh, не живые люди. Instead, they appear to Tvartovsky as mere conventional literary designations, всего лишь условные литературные обозначения. There is no need, Tvartovsky concludes, to go further in discussing the ideological and artistic failure of the work. Uh, the author is not a beginner in need of a literary consultation, but an experienced writer and editor who, in my view, undertook a project that is none of her business. So the second review uh, comes slightly later uh, from Tvartovsky's deputy Dementiev, who maintains that although the novella is faithful in its representation of the year 1937, quote, the author's attitude to the Soviet order is unclear. Um, what Tchaikovsky and Dachmatova both, of course, realized but may have underestimated is that Sofia Petrovna and Requiem stood very far apart from Ivan Denisovich, not only historically, but more importantly, ideologically, socially, and uh, allegorically. Tchaikovsky pretended to believe that Fordovsky rejected Sofia Petrovna on purely creative rather than social grounds. Uh, he did not like it as a work of art, uh, she mentions in a conversation with Akhmatova. 
But in another conversation, she adds, um, one need, need to, needs to give a mujik to Twardowski. Twardowskomu mujika podawai. But Sofia Petrovna is a city dweller of half intelligentsia, garajanka polintelligentka. He is not interested in this. What it interests him is the village. Requiem is no village either, said Anna Andreevna, end of quote. So, um, we discussed this uh, not so long ago, uh, that, of course, Muzhik is such a loaded <laughs> uh, Russian word that is just doesn't, it does not even get translated, but, of course, it means not only a peasant, it also means uh, it's a gender uh, issue, which is interesting to speculate about here, uh, which or both, perhaps, of these meanings Tchaikovsky had in mind, but perhaps underplayed uh, uh, one of those. Um, of course, it was like a Mushskoy club, Tchaikovsky, uh, uh, sorry, Tvardovsky, Khrushchev, Lebedev, Dementiev, etc. Uh, so it was, in other words, uh, precluded uh, from being published on the grounds of it not only being uh, socialist realism, or rather being half socialist realism, as I will uh, try to illustrate a bit later, but also uh, that it was written from and about a, a female perspective. So, what stood behind Twardowski's support for Ivan Denisovich and his uncompromising rejections of Requiem, Sofia Petrovna, and numerous other manuscripts that kept accumulating in his archive in Novi Mir um, was his. Um, was the so-called Solzhenitsyn standard, as uh, Denis Kozlov defines it in his uh, study of Novy Mir, uh, the readers of Novy Mir. Uh, so uh, Ivan Denisovich is clearly much closer approaching it to Tvarkovsky's own Vasily Turkin, uh, as well as uh, thematically touches on something that Tvarkovsky was working in the 50s, uh, the chapter uh, from his narrative poem, The Day You Die, uh, about the returnees of the Gulag. Uh, however, inseparable from the great terror for Tvordovsky was the terror of collectivization, which, to be fair, neither Akhmatova nor Tchukovsky emphasized, uh, or emphasized enough in their texts, while in Solzhenitsyn's novella, the plight of the peasants is the inescapable background of all Shukhov's misfortunes. This may be the main reason why, for example, Twardowski rejects Krutoy Marshrut uh, by Evgenia Ginsburg, uh, who famously begins, begins it with, this, uh, with the sentence, quote, the year 1937 began to all intents and purposes at the end of 1934, to be exact on the 1st of December, that is the date of uh, the assassination of Kirov in Leningrad, but certainly not uh, the atrocities being taking place in the village earlier. Uh, so, party purchase, but not the plight of the peasants. <clears throat> Tvardovsky, who must have read more texts about the camps than anyone else in the country at the time, was looking above all for what he called human documents, человеческие документы, that is, eyewitness accounts bearing testimonial quality. Um, in other words, so Solzhenitsyn was a standard, but if you think of it, that standard, of course, existed before uh, Tvardovsky reads the manuscript, and it simply matches or responds or conforms to uh, Tvardovsky's ideal, uh, social and literary. So, the idea, uh, now I still hope uh, to, to have time for a few more words about uh, this conformity. The idea of the novella of Ivan Denisovich goes back to 1950, uh, when Solzhenitsyn was still in the camps himself, but he began writing uh, the text of the one, one Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich nine years later. Uh, more precisely, on May 18th, 1959. Uh, it happens so that on the exact same day, uh, the Third Congress of the Soviet Writers Union opens in Moscow. And on the third day of that Congress, uh, Khrushchev appears before the writers with a speech called Служение народу высокое призвание советских писателей, serving the people as a lofty calling of Soviet writers, in which he instructs them just who good books should be written about. Uh, quote, a good work of literature is when it shows 
is when it shows a positive hero. Uh, but not everything is approved in this hero. He is seen as he appears in life. Uh, this is both natural and correct. After all, some kind of heroes uh, need to be used to educate, uh, shouldn't they? And evidently the positive ones. I am for those writers and for that method, which takes positive facts to, uh, and raises the pathos of labor, ignites people, falls upon them and shows the way. Along the way, so to speak, it strips the positive hero of everything that has gone into past, everything that needs to be cut off. End of quote. Um, no wonder that three years later, on December 1st, 1962, Khrushchev, not being too exquisite in uh, the differences between the protagonist and the author, he, sets, he, he names Solzhenitsyn as, as an example to the avant-garde artists of Romania, and speaks of Solzhenitsyn, the writer, not so much about Ivan Denisovich himself as, as the model. Uh, of course, Khrushchev's views on literature are far from being the best angle to look at the positive hero uh, in, Soviet, in Soviet literature and socialist realism. Uh, it is explored in quite different terms in Sinyavsky's essay uh, on socialist realism written in 1957, thereby conveniently devoid of the anxiety of influence of Solzhenitsyn's work, uh, which is a later one. The positive here in Sinyavsky's essay uh, is the sanctum sanctorum of socialist realism, the official literary method which was never really ruled out even during the warm, warmest years of the thought. Um, uh, the second uh, necessary uh, mandatory element of socialist realism is the purpose, uh, the, the ultimate triumph of communism, of course, but on the daily uh, level, it is something that the positive hero pursues necessarily. Um, the ending, Sinyavsky writes, may be sad for the hero, but it is happy from the point of view of the superior purpose. One day in the life of Van Denisovich, which Solzhenitsyn presents as a miniature model of life in the camps. Likewise, turned out to be unclouded, and this is the key word here, almost a happy one. It ends with a list of small fortunes, which includes include even uh, a few round pieces of sausage that Shukhov receives from, receives from Cezar, the only intelligent in the camp, who is, of course, socially inferior uh, to the peasant Ivan Denisovich. The daily cycle of Solzhenitsyn's novella ends on a happy, or I should repeat this, almost happy note. And if the driving vehicle of socialist realism is the positive hero in pursuit of a purpose, then Ivan Denisovich can be described as a positive hero without a purpose, unlike, unless, like Khrushchev, we take him at his face value. His resourcefulness and good spirits and workers still are, of course, uh, not so much tools of building socialism, but his basic means of self-preservation. A similar uh, positive hero, deprived of, of a purpose, uh, will soon be turned up in the Russian village prose, in Matryonin Dvor, Matryonin's place, in Solzhenitsyn's own work, uh, which is only a few months younger, uh, so to speak. Uh, it comes out in January 1963 in Novinir. Shukhov also, well, uh, there is a lot to, uh, to talk about here uh, from Sinyavsky's perspective, but if I may, I would also like to add something from uh, Katerina Clark article on uh, that I mentioned earlier on socialist realism with Shores, um, namely uh, uh, that the backbone of the socialist realist tradition is the novel. Uh, which here brings us perhaps to the uh, question of Solzhenitsyn and Shalamov, who is categorically against the novel, the novel, according to Shalamov, and any fiction and literature as such, uh, is buried in the same mass grave as the millions of prisoners in Kalima. Uh, so he, he writes something that he defines as the new prose, uh, which is not, uh, not literature. Uh, the essential structure, to quote Katerina Clark's paper, of the socialist realist novel is parabolic. Uh, that means it has a center uh, of gravity, if you, if, you, if you still remember what a parabola is. <laughs> and uh, uh, it is 
I would uh, perhaps like to add that maybe, uh, yes, it's parabolic, but at the same time, it can also be, um, its structure can be described uh, as a spiral, uh, which Claude Lévi-Strauss introduces as the structure of myth in uh, the late 50s. And that uh, spiral is, as myth, uh, it is much, it lives much longer, uh, certainly, than history. And uh, the structure of Solzhenitsyn's novella, One Day in the Life of Andinis, which it's like loops and uh, spiral cyclical structures that constitute the composition of that work uh, and perhaps resonate uh, on the level of Solzhenitsyn's other titles, uh, The Red Wheel, uh, even the Gulag of Kipilago, and what else? In, in the first circle, of course, uh, and can it even be projected, perhaps, uh, onto his uh, biography and his triumphant coming back, uh, return to Moscow via Alaska and Vladivostok. Um, something that socialist realist novel um, especially cherishes is, of course, the myth uh, of the great family uh, with the father uh, being the ultimate leader of the country, but uh, his son, or multiple sons, uh, following in his, the father's footsteps. Uh, so Ivan Denisovich is average age, uh, but yet perhaps we could say that Buinovsky, Captain Buinovsky, after rank, uh, is one of those father figures uh, who is nevertheless isolated and uh, thrown into the punishment cell for the rest of the novel at some point, but he is clearly the example. And he has a real-life prototype uh, who, after his uh, release uh, from the camp's work, works as, uh, I forget exactly, but he works on Casey Aurora in the uh, Naval, Military Naval Museum and keeps giving interviews uh, about Solzhenitsyn in his, as his uh, bunk, uh, bunk bed neighbor. So on the other shore, uh, the West, when Ivan Denisovich is published uh, in Moscow, it becomes a major sensation and a breakthrough uh, on the other shore. Uh, what it is, and it is very interesting to analyze the reception uh, of something that comes out in Gosses that through the lens uh, of very different, uh, what we tend to think, very different uh, aesthetic, aesthetics and ideology. Uh, first of all, the um, everyone, nearly every reviewer, uh, Amy Gray or Thomas that reviewers highlight uh, a typological or simply a coincidence that the publication of Van Denisovich in 1962 marks the centennial of the first publication of Dostoevsky's The House of the Dead in 1862. And uh, Frank Reeve even titles his review The House of the Living, uh, his review of Ivan Denisovich, <coughs> highlighting that, uh, like his fellow emigre reviewers, the artistic rather than the socio-political merits of Solzhenitsyn's work. Uh, so it's it's a really uh, fairly subvertible land. It's it's the opposite. Uh, if in the Soviet Union Solzhenitsyn's breakthrough was mainly thematic, uh, the theme itself was for the first time articulated in official press. Uh, abroad in Tamis that criticism, uh, everyone mentions that there is really nothing new in in the facts or in the theme itself, uh, and that it's the aesthetic orchestration uh, of the of this fictional work, work of fiction, that is powerful. Nevertheless, um, like most readers in the West, uh, who were allegedly more familiar with the Gulag topic than readers behind the Iron Curtain, Frank Reeve learns, quote, nothing we did not know from the sad and horrible stories of people who endured the camps in Russia and Germany in all the other countries that ever existed, end of quote. Um, Yet what critics in the free world knew much less about was the extent to which uh, this book, as uh, Reeve assumed, does not preclude others yet to be written, quote unquote. Or, another quote, same quote, continuation, excuse the prohibition of others already written but still unpublished. 
Um, well, the review is being written in 1963, the same year as Requiem, uh, having been precluded from being published at home, is published in Tamistad, which I find extremely interesting, uh, if only on the level of, a, of it being a coincidence. Uh, another critic, Evgeny Garanin, uh, likewise says that there is nothing new in the fact that Solzhenitsyn tells us as such. Uh, and if there is anything Solzhenitsyn can ever be criticized for, it is, according to the reviewer, the fact that, contrary to the reader's expectations, um, anyway, that, sorry, one finds, quote, almost exclusively those who have suffered for nothing. How come, Garanin asks, uh, were, were there really no active opponents of the regime in the Soviet concentration camps, those who would wound up behind the barbed wire, not on some trumped up charges, but for, for their convictions and deeds. Of course there were. Uh, so his um, criticism of Solzhenitsyn is that should have, should have looked uh, <coughs> and listened to, to the real uh, political prisoners, not so much uh, his fellow former so soldiers, etc. Uh, Roman Gulin, 1963, uh, writes a review in Novy Journal, which he titles Alexander Solzhenitsyn Isot's Realism, uh, in which he claims that even though the novella was clearly uh, a tool of destalinization aligned with Khrushchev's current policy, its reception and impact in Russia and in the West are far, far from being the same. While in the Soviet Union it played the role of a true aid in the sacred and necessary campaign to expose the cult of personality, uh, for, for us in the West, he writes, it does not expose anything at all. Uh, people in the West have, been, have known the truth about forced labor and concentration camps for several decades, and it is true. And in this sense, Solzhenitsyn's work is extremely belated, end of quote. Nevertheless, he proclaims it as Predvesnik um, Ukazania Puti для Ruskoy Literatury, a harbinger pointing out a path for Russian literature, which uh, furthermore crosses, quote, crosses out the entire socialist realism that is the entire Soviet literature. Uh, these two uh, phenomena are identified, uh, which tells us something about the understanding of socialist realism in Tavistad. Um, so, I should end here, but uh, the last uh, thought I would like to suggest and perhaps discuss is that socialist realism is not limited, uh, as the title of Dabrenko Zedlachuzin's book, uh, is not limited to any particular shores and certainly splashes uh, beyond. Uh, and lives on, and perhaps it has to do something with it being uh, a much broader uh, phenomenon, not simply literary or aesthetic, but mythological. Uh, and the myths, myths long live uh, much longer, and we can certainly witness something of a socialist, realist character in contemporary uh, Russian films, in Sabibor, if, you, if, you, if you've seen that, uh, etc. So it does not end even with the fall of the Soviet Union, and nor does uh, the openness <laughs> to interpretations of Ivan Dinesevich. Thank you.